There's nothing like taking a big bite out of a steep learning curve. Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 334. Today, I'm joined by fellow martial arts podcaster Jeff Westfall. If you're new to the show, you might not know that we have show notes with transcripts and links and all kinds of great stuff at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You also might not know my name. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I get to talk to martial artists as part of my job. And the other part of my job is Whistlekick. Whistlekick Whistlekick.com, where we make protective equipment. And as of the recording of this, quite a few other things are nearly on board. It is going to be an exciting fall. But of course, you might be listening to this in the future. We don't put any kind of dates or times really on our episodes. We just let them out there for posterity. You can listen to them anytime you want. We don't charge for them. We don't charge for, you know, the old ones or the new ones or any of those silly things that some podcasts do. We really just want to help spread the traditional martial arts through podcasts, getting you excited, getting you motivated, helping you answer some of those challenging philosophical questions that might you know, hold you back from your training, or maybe an answer comes up in an episode that helps enhance your training. We do this for you because, to be honest, I wanted to do it for me. But let's talk about today's guest. Mr. Jeff Westfall is the host of the Marshall Brain podcast, which is an incredibly thoughtful, original, really philosophical podcast on, you guessed it, the martial arts. I've enjoyed listening to the episodes of his show that I have listened to. Full disclosure, I don't get to listen to all of them because there's a lot of great martial arts content out there. And as you might imagine, a lot of time goes into creating this stuff. But of the shows that I do enjoy listening to, his is definitely up there. I'm not going to say if he's at the top because I don't want to make anybody else feel badly, but he's in that mix with a few others. And for good reason. Here on Martial Arts Radio, he. He doesn't hold back. He goes deep. He talks about what makes him tick, what makes the martial arts so powerful, so transformative for him. And we talk about philosophy and training and his influences and just so much other good stuff. And rather than continuing to try to summarize as I'm doing right now, I'm just going to take a step back and let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Westfall, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Here we are. We're chatting on an American holiday. It's, it's, it's Labor Day today, but, you know, I generally find myself celebrating Labor Day by working. <laughs> How about you? Are you familiar with the origin of, of Labor Day as an American holiday? Barely. So we, well, most countries of the world that celebrate labor celebrate May Day. Um, but there were, there were riots in Chicago back in the late 1800s. Um, a lot of the corporations hadn't lost power yet from Teddy Roosevelt busting up uh, monopolies. And there were a lot of, of uh, labor people killed at, at a riot in Chicago, a May Day riot. And the um, whole thing sort of cropped up. People were terrified that communists were going to take over the United States. And, um, and May Day became associated with communism. So the United States is one of the only countries in the world celebrates a separate Labor Day, uh, separate from May Day. Well, there we go. I just learned something. And now we can end the show. <laughs> you know, th- that's... Now, I'm, I'm going to be the, the, the first one to admit, I do not have the time to listen to all of the podcasts I want to listen to. When your oh, who does? show... Right. When your show popped up on my radar, I did, you know, I listened to a few episodes. And it, what the story you just told, that, that informative bit, I think it's a pretty good anecdote for, for you, if I may say, that you're very knowledgeable and you kind of wander around in a way that I do and just talk about stuff. Is, is, is oh, that fair? You. Am, I, am I offending you in saying that? Oh, no, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I, I am a constant irritant to those around me with uh, unsolicited information. Uh, unsolicited trivia, and I'm I am frequently reminded by people that they really just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, if 
if there ever was a forum for you to present unsolicited exactly. information about almost anything. Yeah, podcasting is perfect because, you know, you can turn it off. You know, I tell people, it, I would tell you right now about this, but I made it in number 37. So go listen to it or don't. But now I got it out of my system and I edited it and I got it just the way I want. It's kind of like having a, a dad or a grandpa that keeps telling the same old stories. Mm. You know, and so I just, instead of repeating it, I just go, number 38. <laughs> <laughs> and you say it in that voice too, don't you? Exactly, yes. <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of crotchety, get off my lawn sort of inflection. <laughs> well, you know, it is, it really is a perfect um, a format for someone who, who is, who likes to talk about things and then, and then really put it in good form, but put it in a good format, uh, do the research, leave out the uhs and the ahs and the you knows. You know, it's, it's a really, it, 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 and another thing that one of the reasons I got into podcasting was, um, I'm really into, a, a scientific skepticism. And that's a big part of the, of the, the structure of the, of the, uh, the podcast, kind of the intersection between science and the martial arts and especially critical thinking and skepticism. And I, I actually occasionally go to gatherings of scientific skeptics. And it, it occurred to me one day when I was at one, that I was the biggest jock there. And then it occurred to me that when I'm a gather at a gathering of martial artists, that I'm the biggest nerd there. And I mm -hmm. thought, wow, I, I, I sit at an intersection. And that was really the beginning of the podcast. Yeah, that, that's, you know, I think I can relate. I think I can relate generally when I, when I am in, uh, among my more academic friends. I'm, I would be the only one telling stories that involve sweating profusely. Right, right. And they look so, at you like you have a, a third eye growing in the middle of your right. forehead or something. Yeah, why, <laughs> why would you do that? Now, normally we don't do this at, at the top of the show, but since we've already gone, you know, what's that? Close to five minutes. We've, we've talked about the fact that you have a podcast, but I'm sure there are listeners out there slapping the speaker or their phone or something saying, Jeremy, <laughs> This is rude. What show? Now, I'm sure we have a ton of crossover listeners, at least hopefully, because you have a great show and we're kind of flipping well, the you. format here on the show. Oh, you're, you're welcome. You're welcome. I, I appreciate anybody that will dedicate themselves to this format and get beyond episode 10 has some dedication. They have some passion. And that's why I think I've connected as we were talking before I hit the record button. You know, I've made friendships with several other martial arts podcasters. I, I think we all have something in common. Well, I, probably a lot in common, but why yeah, don't... Either, either dedication or neuropathology, one or the other. <laughs> Likely both. <laughs> I, I, would, I would suspect there are quite a few um, symptoms that we could check off on, on a diagnosis. <laughs> Tell the listeners just a little okay. bit about your show, and then we'll go all the way back in time, and we'll start talking about you and how you started in martial arts. Cool. Um, it's called the Marshall Brain. Um, someone told me early on, well, you should call it like the Marshall Philosophy or the Marshall Mind. And that just didn't quite hit it because one of the elements of scientific skepticism, uh, especially when, especially in brain science that fascinates me, is that your, your mind is not separate from your brain. There's this concept of, of the Cartesian duality that your brain and your or that your mind and your body are separate. And I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to have any confusion. So I wanted it to be the, the brain of the martial artist as the theme. And a lot of people get confused and they think I'm calling myself a brain and that I, I'm the namesake of the podcast and nothing could be further from the truth. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, first of all and foremost, it's simply me talking about whatever the heck I want to talk about. Um, and it's free, so you don't have to listen. But I try to keep it most of the time even if I have to drive 30 miles out of the way, I try to steer it back to the martial arts, no matter what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, it's my take on the intersection based on a given topic on a given day of the martial arts, uh, scientific skepticism, critical thinking skills, science in general and science um, literacy and history and language and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's basically me giving myself license to bloviate 
and kind of keeping martial arts as a theme. If that makes any sense at all. <laughs> it absolutely does, because I think that that's quite often how I look at Thursday episodes for us. You know, we do we do two a week and Mondays, you know, this will come out on a Monday. I'm not sure which one yet. On Thursdays, two a week. You are you are a busy young man. I, I am. I I am a busy man. <laughs> I am. Um, and you know, like uh, I was on vacation, quote unquote, vacation last week. And as I was traveling from, I was traveling back to the states from New Brunswick, Canada. I had my GoPro on a dash mount, and I was recording a Thursday episode. You know, just, <laughs> it was something that I I needed to. I needed to get off my chest. I needed to to talk this out. And what better way to work things out in your own mental process than knowing when someone else is listening? Sure, sure. That, I, that, that's very well put. I'm going to steal that. I, I was interviewed for another podcast last week, and, and the, the, uh, the host uh, said something really pithy, and I'm, I'm just, I stole that. So I'm going to steal that. I like that. Yeah. See, I would it's, sort of, it's, sort of, it's sort of like a deadline sharpening the mind. When you know there's going to be an audience, it, it changes the way you do it. It changes the way you put it together, which is cool. Absolutely. And I think that we can draw some corollary there with martial arts. There are plenty of Absolutely. people who, I mean, for, for good or for bad, the way they will spar and the way they will practice their basics, the same movements, the way they put themselves into them can be so dramatically different. Yes. Yes. And that can change over time through the influence of a good instructor or a training partner, too. For sure. So let's bring it back now. Now, now that the audience knows you're a thoughtful person with a martial arts podcast, and we both likely need to be committed for <laughs> engaging in that endeavor. Let's talk about how martial arts found its way into your life. Sure. Um, like so many of my generation, uh, I'll, be, I'll be 61 next month. Um, like so many of my generation, my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle and Power Rangers was Kato, Bruce Lee playing Kato on the Green Hornet. Um, I think when that series got started, I was about 10. And um, that just, it was, I mean, if you, I kind of like to compare it to Star Trek as well. A lot of people like to make fun of the Green Hornet or they like to make fun of the original series. But, they, but it's so out of context because when you look at the wasteland of television in the 60s and compare it to what else was out there, the martial arts that Bruce Lee was doing on uh, the Green Hornet was just so far beyond anything else, including the James Bond movies. You know, it's just, you mm -hmm. could just, anybody who looked at him move saw, holy cow, look at this guy move. And I was utterly captivated. And, um, uh, Two years later, in 1971, he did uh, the, the pilot episode of a TV series called Long Street about a blind insurance detective. And the very first episode was entitled The Way of the Intercepting Fist. And it featured Bruce Lee as a guy teaching uh, martial arts to this blind detective. And that's the first time I heard the phrase Jeet Kune Do was in that episode. And I had already started taking Kyokushin Karate when I saw that episode. I had been tra training in it for, I don't know, about a year or so at that point. And I was a constant irritant to my teachers by, you know, asking them about Bruce Lee right from the beginning, <laughs> as, as I'm sure a lot of people nowadays are irritated by their students bringing up this YouTube video or that YouTube video. And um, uh, that was kind of, he was kind of my lodestar. I read every article he wrote in the magazines before the Tao Ji Kwon Do came out and was obsessed with his philosophy. And um, even though I was in Kyokushin, which was a very traditional style, I was always thinking hard about things that he said. But I, I was in Kyokushin uh, from the time I was 13 till I was in college. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, I, a lot of people call it Japanese karate. It's, it's actually hard to pin down because its founder was a Korean uh, non-citizen of Japan named Masoyama. He was a second-class citizen because you couldn't be a citizen of Japan and not be Japanese. His parents were, were migrant uh, laborers in Japan. But he trained under uh, um, Gichin Funakoshi and Shotokan and then founded his own system. So he was a Korean who trained in an Okinawan system under a Japanese guy. Mm -hmm. So whatever you want to call that style of karate, <laughs> that's the style I was in. And then um, uh, about the mid-70s, I started getting involved in a, a kung fu style uh, called Tai Lung. 
And it was sort of a, 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 a the guy who put it together drew from Wing Chun for short range and from Choi Le Foot and Hong Gar for longer range fighting. And I stayed stayed in that um, quite a while. And I, I got my knee done in Kyokushin, my second degree black belt. Um, when I was in uh, the Gong Fu system, I got my, my uh, uh, what he, he, had, he adapted the, um, the belt ranking system, but used sashes. And so I got my black sash uh, about 1979 or so. Um, and then right about, right around 78 before, you know, while that was still going on, I got involved in boxing, uh, really, really liked boxing. I was drawn to it because I knew that Bruce Lee, you know, he, he said quite frequently that it was, had more reality, boxing and judo had more reality in them than a lot of the styles he'd been exposed to. So I was following that. And then in 1984, a number of years later, I, well, I, I started my own academy um, in 80. Before that, I taught people starting in about 77 uh, in garages and basements, uh, one, one-on-one, one-on-two. And then um, uh, I started my academy in 1980. Um, and after about four years of running my academy and teaching uh, mostly the Thailand Gong Fu, but also having a boxing class, and, um, also having uh, 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 students in for uh, open sparring on Saturdays, um, actually not just students, I started a tradition of inviting anyone from any academy to come in and sign a waiver with no pressure to join and spar every Saturday. And that, that was our laboratory because we didn't, the only rule was, you know, uh, be friends when you're done and be careful with each other. So we ground fought, we took each other down. Um, you know, we, we did all kinds of things. We didn't just stick to point fighting rules, but anyway, while that was going on in 1984, I finally got to realize a lifelong ambition. And that was to go train, uh, for a week with Dan and Osado, mm. who was Bruce Lee's best friend and the guy who ran his Chinatown academy for him. And uh, I met him in, in St. Louis, Missouri. He taught a seminar that was a one-week seminar. It was five, eight-hour days. And that was my first exposure. I filled a yellow legal pad notebook, and my head exploded every day, more than once, while it was going on. And I followed um, uh, Gannon Osano around the Midwestern United States, training with him at seminars two, three, four, five times a year for the next seven years. And uh, finally, he said, you know, you should really... Uh, you should really test for instructorship with me. And um, so that was, that kind of blew me away that he thought I was worthy of that. So I did. He, he pointed me in um, a number of directions. He pointed me towards my Muay Thai instructor, who is his uh, current good friend, a man named Surachai Sirisut, the guy who brought Muay Thai to the United States in 1968. Um, and I've, I've been under him uh ever since. As a matter of fact, I'll be bringing him to my academy here in a few weeks. Um, I sort of followed Dan Osano's lead. I mean, he's always going off, uh, finding new things to train in. Um, he, he got me interested in shoot wrestling, which took me to training under Eric Paulson. Um, he got me interested in C-Lot, which kept me training under him, uh, eventually becoming an instructor in a system that he has developed called Maja Pahit, martial arts. Um, and I got involved in Brazilian jiu-jitsu starting in 1993, uh, right at the very beginning of the grappling revolution that hit. Um, I, I, I went to a, a seminar with Hickson Gracie in Cincinnati, Ohio, um, and um, started there. And just got my, I got my black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu about 10 years ago. It took me 17 years to get, because my attention is divided between so many different systems. Um, that's, that's a long, rambling account. I have a, I have a knee down in judo. Uh, when I got got back from uh, the seminar, one of my students who was a judo teacher says, "Why don't you let me teach you judo now that you got into jiu-jitsu? I said, "Well, okay." And so I took private lessons with him for about five or six years and got my knee down in judo. Um, he was a really good teacher, uh, a top level competitor in the Midwest back in the '60s. Um, I'm not sure what I've, if I've left anything out. Uh, is that a pretty good bio for you? Does that work? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good a good summary of the what. So let's let's look at kind of the overarching important question of the why. Why did you start <laughs> martial arts at thirteen? And why at if I if I heard you right, nearly sixty one, are you still training? Um 
Well, uh, again, my role model is Dan Osano in so many ways. But the, the reason I started was my home life was um, pretty dysfunctional. Um, it was a very violent household. Um, my uh, my mother married after my father left when I was four. My mother married a, a real violent loser, alcoholic. It was very abusive. My mother was pretty abusive too. Um, my older brother was not pleasant to be around. Um, it was a very violent place to be, and I was. By the time I was a, a, a young teenager, I was really messed up. I was a smart kid. I was a nerd, and I was scared of my own shadow. And when I first got into martial, or got the chance to train in martial arts, um, I asked my mother first of all if I could take classes, and she refused flat out. She said we couldn't afford it, and she didn't want me messing with it. So what I did was at first, when I first got into Kyokushin, it was a buddy of mine, his older brother. Um, trained in the backyard because there was no Kyokushin instructor in, in Evansville. He had trained in another town and just had a green belt, but he worked out hard in his backyard. He had a Makiwara. Uh, he, he would get any, anybody in the neighborhood to come over and spar with him. There was a Taekwondo school locally. He tried to get those guys to come over and spar with him. And so I would go over there and I didn't really take it seriously because I was convinced that I wasn't athletic and that I could never could be athletic. But I was like a lot of nerds. I was fascinated by it, so I just wanted to sit and watch. But he wouldn't. He wouldn't put up with that. He made me get up and do what I could. And um, after a couple of years of that, I started training more formally. But uh, um, I joke with people that it took me my first two years of training to reach the level of physical ability of a, of a standard issue human being. Um, I was, you know, such a a non-athletic kid. Um, and I, I literally believed at that time, by the way, that it wasn't possible for me to become, uh, it wasn't possible for me to improve myself physically through practice. I just had in my head, I just had myself in this box mentally that, well, practicing and exercising is a waste of time for me because I'm not athletic. I'll never get better. So why spin my wheels? And of course, I'd put myself in this box myself. And then one day this fellow was, uh, we were talking about martial arts and I, I threw a sidekick and held it out a little bit. And he goes, wow, Jeff, your sidekick has gotten a lot better. And in my mind, I couldn't get better. And this guy who I respected told me that. And I said, well, you know, don't, don't lie to me. Don't play with me. He goes, no, no, it looks better than mine. And my head exploded when he said that. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my gosh, I can get better if I just practice. And that's when I started getting into more formal training but like I said, also, as I said, from the beginning, I was obsessed with Bruce Lee's eclecticism when it came to martial arts. My first few teachers weren't that good. I don't want to name too many names, but I had a lot of bad examples coming up. Actually, John, my friend, was a pretty good teacher, uh, but he wasn't, he wasn't very far along. He, I, I liked his attitude, but a lot of teachers that I got after that were, you know, either extremely, extremely doctrinaire martinets, you know, drill instructor types, or a few of them were, uh, one fellow who I, who I tried to train with turned out to be a fraud. Um, you know, a lot of different things. I ran through a lot of bad instructors, which gave me a lot of, a lot of drive to never teach like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, and so in the, in the early days, I was just, I was, I was the classic martial arts seeker. Um, and when I, when I finally met uh, uh, the, the gentleman I trained in, in Gong Fu, uh, was a pretty good teacher sometimes, other times not so much. And I learned a lot of interesting things, but we butted heads a lot. And then when I finally met Dan and Osano, that was it. I knew I had found a good teacher. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford to, to move to Los Angeles. But um, I would listen dutifully to what he showed and what he did and train it like crazy. And then when I'd go back, I'd I'd harass the heck out of him and say, is it like this? Go, no, it's not like that. Watch during the seminar today. And he would pull me up to be his, his dummy frequently. And, um, I, I probably, I spent a number of hours him, you know, beating me up and, and locking and making me tap between the years of 1984 and 1994, a lot through, throughout the Midwest. Um, and, and it was just, you know, I, I noticed when I finally went out to his academy, 
we, we went together to a, a jiu-jitsu academy, to the, uh, to the Machado Brothers Academy. And I noticed how happy he was to put on a white belt and how, how it just it made him really happy to not be the teacher, but to be the student. And I emulated that. I thought, well, that's really cool, you know. And and as time has gone on, I've I've realized how smart he is because there's nothing like I say this in one of my most recent podcasts. There's nothing like taking a big bite out of a steep learning curve, and the learning curve is is so steep at the early part of a martial art. You know, when you first get into it, you learn in big chunks, and I just find that interesting to compare the basics of one system to another and find out what they share with each other. I don't know. I've, I've been rambling. Does that make sense? No, it, it does. And you're hitting on a subject that we've talked about quite a bit with quite a number of guests. And, and you know, you're saying you're talking about it too. This notion of maintaining the, the mindset of a white belt, this realization that there's Absolutely. always so much out there to learn. And there seems to be, you know, we, we, we talked about science and, and scientific method and, and some things early on, but I don't know that anybody's done any quote unquote research on this, but I suspect that the best martial artists and the happiest martial artists are those who have trained in the most different things, who have engaged in the most diversity with their martial arts experience. Would you agree? I would agree with that. A lot depends on, on what it is, that the, the, why they're doing the martial arts. I mean, let's face it, there are plenty of people who practice the martial arts for reasons that we might disagree with, um, especially those who do it for status. You know, the... I, I jokingly say that I know a lot of martial arts instructors that are instructors so they can tell people that they're instructors. Um, so, you know, for me, I agree that what makes me the happiest is I hope I learn a technique the day I die. You know, I, I, I just, I love it. I, and I love analyzing and synthesizing and coming up with stuff on my own. I, you know, I remember when, when I finally gave myself permission to do that, you know, where, where it's like someone said to me once, well, if you just make up a technique, that's not legitimate. I said, well, Bruce Lee said, <laughs> you know, absorb what's useful, uh, reject what is useless and keep what is uniquely your own, you know, what works best for your body. Cause your body will invent moves that, that you didn't even realize based on the way you're built. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm most happy when I'm, uh, either learning something new or, or doing analysis, comparing how this Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor does this technique versus that instructor versus that instructor. They'll each do the same technique a little differently. And I'll ask them, well, why do you do it like that? You know, and well, if you put your big toe two inches this way, you get leverage like this. I just, I love that stuff. It's amazing to me. One of my favorite things about martial arts is that, and, and, and I don't know that this will ever change and, and you've got a couple of years on me, so maybe you can speak a bit more to it to, to validate or, or blow up my theory. But it seems that the more I learn about martial arts, the more I realize how much more there is to learn. And this, this, depending on your perspective, incredibly depressing or immensely exciting realization that you will never learn all of it. Yeah, I, I, I like to compare that phenomenon that you just described to, uh, on a larger scale, to science. You know, the more we discover, the we, as science has gone on, we've, we've picked a lot of the low-hanging fruit, you know, the stuff that you could just simply figure out through observation. And now we're having to extend our senses through scientific instruments and, and go deeper and deeper. And now things like, you know, dark matter and, and quantum physics are becoming harder and harder to study. And it, it takes more and more precision and deep thought. And, but the more and more we discover, the more we realize my gosh, it just simply pushes the frontiers further out of what we don't know. And, um, and, and I can see where that can be depressing on the, on the one hand. But on the other hand, you know, it's, I think it, it lifts the quality of what you're doing. You know, it's uh, the myth that, that you can ever, quote, master, unquote, any martial art um, gets blown out of, out of the sky, with, as it should be. And so I think on the one hand, like you said, we, we realize the more we learn, the more there is yet to learn and becomes completely, uh, it becomes completely unattainable to learn what, you know, all the things we'd like, but yet at the same time, uh, I find a, I find a comfort in that. Um, mm, because, yeah. you know, because, because the people coming along behind us, 
you know, they want, they, they want to look at us as some sort of paragon that knows everything. And we just turn around and go, no, son, I'm just one step ahead of you on this treadmill, you know, <laughs> jump up on here and learn what you can before you die. <laughs> but yeah, I, I like to compare it to the, to the history of science. And I, I think they both, they both have a, a similar arc in that regard. Hmm. Can you apply, I'm, I'm, there, there's, a, there's a notion I'm turning into words here. Can you train in the martial arts scientifically? Mm. Well, sure. Yeah. Um, first of all, scientifically is a very broad term. Intentionally um, so. I, and I was going to say, and I bet you meant it that way. Um, I think, first of all, a lot of people have tried to pin down exactly what the scientific method is. And there, there's, there's debate among scientific philosophers about what exactly it is. But I think a, a good basic working model is to um, observe the universe around you, observe the natural world. Um, once you gather enough information, maybe formulate a hypothesis and then continue to, to, to do research, but in the direction of, of uh, trying to disprove that hypothesis um, rather than prove it. And if you can't disprove it, you get closer and closer to, to finding out whether or not you're onto something. And I, I think you can do that with martial arts. Now, of course, the traditional paradigm is you train with an instructor and you, you listen to what the instructor tells you respectfully, as you should. But yet at the same time, you know, you have training partners and you can, you can test hypotheses when you're sparring or when you're, when you're doing different drills. And, you, and if your instructor is open-minded to this, you can even ask them questions you know, about why does this technique work? What, what, what's the physics behind this technique? And if he's not sure, you know, learn for yourself. Learn a little bit about physics. Learn a little bit about the biology. But absolutely, the more you learn about the human body, the more you learn about the laws of physics, the more a lot of the things that we already do begin to make sense. And I think um, that you can extend that over time. Now, I think a big factor in whether or not you can train in the martial arts scientifically, first of all, starts with what is the level of scientific literacy of the people who put the system together that you're training in? Uh, and what is your level of scientific literacy? Um, I think most modern martial arts systems have a, a healthy dose of, of science in them. I mean, you know, you're, the reason a martial arts stance has stability is because of the number of square inches or square centimeters, you know, uh, connecting the, like if you draw a line connecting your two feet when you're in a stance, connect your heels with a line, connect your toes with a line, and then you measure the number of square centimeters in that, that's a direct reflection of how stable that stance is. Um, and I think a lot of people, they may not have known it exactly that way, but just through sheer repetition and figuring things out, you know, there's been a lot of sort of rule of thumb science applied from the beginning. This is a lot of folks did it without having a degree necessarily or doing the math. Uh, but absolutely. I, to be honest, I think the question is, can you do martial arts unscientifically? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know that you can really. An interesting concept and one that I suspect if, if we really dig into that rabbit hole, we're probably not coming out today. So I want to, <laughs> I want to put that one aside and leave it for listeners sure. kind of, you know, contemplate on their own. Here on the show, I love stories and I love getting people to tell stories. And that's really kind of the, the, was the impetus for this show. I was tired of going to events and having to wait for all of the, the masters or whoever to have a few too many beers before I heard great stories. So I said, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a show that coaxes people, if not browbeats them, into sharing their stories. So what is your favorite story from your time training? Goodness. I have to think about that. But okay. Um, a lot of them I've already put on my podcast. Um, some of them are more humorous. You know, some of them are uh, sad. Uh, gosh, I don't know about my favorite. Man, I really have to think about this. It's all right. You know, and and it, it doesn't have to be anything of any particular format. You know, we've had folks who have shared 
unfortunate real world self defense scenarios they found themselves in, or individuals who had something particularly funny, or even just something that was, in hindsight, very pivotal for them. And that's why I use that that adjective favorite, you know, instead of saying best, or actually, it used to be your best story. And that made people think it had to be something big and dramatic. But I find that when we ask the question in this way, not only do we get to hear a story, which makes me happy, but the story that you've chosen, by virtue that you've chosen it, tells us something about you and who you are. Hmm. Let's see. Um, goodness. I have to, I have to keep thinking here a minute. Okay. There, there are so many. Um, well, one, I don't know if this would apply or not. You know, I mentioned that, uh, uh, Guru in Osanto, uh, suggested that I, um, uh, test with him. And I, I said, well, I don't know that I can make it out to Los Angeles anytime soon. And he goes, well, just keep coming to seminars. And I did. And I started noticing that he um, started pulling me up to be his, his dummy or his, his uke more and more and more. And then one day at a, at a seminar in St. Louis in 1991. Um, no, I, I'm sorry. I think it was. I'd have to go back and look at my certificate. It might have been a, a year or two after that, but I think so. Anyway, when the seminar was over and he was handing out participation certificates, he, he called me up and he, he promoted me right there to instructor. And I didn't realize I was being tested all through. And I noticed at the seminar that for the first time ever, he called me up to be his assistant or to demonstrate things. Every time he wanted something demonstrated, he didn't demonstrate a lot of the things himself. He had me come up and do it. And I thought, wow, this is unusual. And then at the end of the day, he hands me the certificate. And I, and I was there by myself. I had gone. I didn't have a training partner with me. I, I met a guy there who, was my, who had become my training partner. And I had no one at the moment to share this with. And I just started bawling. You know, was, <laughs> I, I didn't, didn't think, I, as, as I talked to so many people about when you when you earn a significant ranking in the martial arts, you almost never feel like you deserve it. And I was like, I don't deserve this, you know. And and I was happy and shocked, and and I was I, I, if I had a cell phone, I would have called my my wife the moment I got in the car on the way home, way home. But of course, it was cell phones didn't exist yet. And I I drove home and told her about it. She goes, Oh, that's nice. <laughs> You know, I had to tell my students and my friends before anybody who who grasped the significance of it and could appreciate it. That that might be, you know, one of the pivotal stories. Um, it's not really much of a story; it's just an incident that happened. But pretty f fundamental to who you are now, wouldn't you say? Very, yeah, very fundamental. Yes, very fundamental. Um, you know, he's he's just such a a great guy. I. I remember getting ready to go to this first seminar, this first week long camp with him in 1984. And I, I had already trained um, with some other folks whom I won't name some big names who I learned good things from, but I just didn't like him as a person. And I was so interested in Bruce Lee's approach to the martial arts that I was perfectly prepared for him to not be a very nice person. And I was going to put up with that, as so many of us have with various teachers through the years, you know, to get to the knowledge. And it was just such a delight to find out what a wonderful person he was and how humble he was. And I, and I, you hear that a lot about a lot of martial arts teachers, but Dan and Osano is almost pathologically humble. <laughs> it's, it's sometimes you, you almost want to go over and say, come on, brag a little bit, girl. You know, but he's just, he is just such a great role model. And so I was so, humbled and and touched when he did that to me and for me certainly dan and asanto is a name that is is kicked around a lot i mean plenty of stories out there plenty of mentions even on the show we've talked about him quite a few, excuse me quite a few times do you think i did an entire four-part podcast about I, him i believe it uh, I believe it. And, and we'll make sure we link that in the show notes. And this is probably a good time to let people know, you know, we're going to link to everything. We're going to link to your podcast and everything you've got going on, your social and whatever over on our show notes. 
whistlekick martial arts radio.com that way people don't have to Great. got notes if they're if driving I could throw one, th- if i could throw in one more thing about him yeah please he's almost got he's, he's almost got this forrest gump like or zelig if you're familiar with the woody allen movie like of or or you know the game uh, six degrees of kevin bacon the the yeah. The amazing, the amazing people that he has been connected with in his life, not just because of his fame, but even before that, um, are, are so, it's so many people. And that was the theme of the four part podcast I did. I called it one or two degrees of Dan and Osano. And it was a combination of a biography of him and how he connects up with all of these amazing, famous people all through his, his life story. So it's, it's a, it's probably the highest rated four episodes of my podcast. Mm. Anyway, I'm, I'm interrupted you. Please go ahead. Quite, quite all right. This is your episode. It's my show, but it's your episode. So as far as I'm concerned, you should be interrupting me and certainly not the other way. But when you, when you look at, at this man, this, I, I think we can all agree living legend in the martial arts, and we don't have a lot of them anymore. Nope. Do you think that humility is part of why he's reached not only the 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 standing you know the place in our hearts but more importantly his skill absolutely and i'll tell you why it comes down to one phrase martial arts diplomatic genius Mm. Um, okay that that's something that you've said before i suspect that that came off the top far too easy well he he has trained in so many different systems and so many of the people who he's trained under can't stand each other (laughs) and he can get them in the same room with each other and no one else can. Um, He has got this ability to just navigate the, the shark infested waters of martial arts politics. And because he's such a nice guy, it's impossible almost to hate him uh, unless you just are such a, you know, pathological cretin that you manufacture a reason to hate him um that that it's enabled him to have access to all these different sources of information i think so i think that his humility has been directly connected to his ability to uh find these different sources find these different people i think another element was i talk about this in the podcast about him try to think back to um what it must have been like when Bruce Lee died for him. Um, he was in charge of, of uh, Bruce Lee's Chinatown Academy. Uh, he had left Dan Osano in charge of it when he went to, to uh, Hong Kong to make movies. Um, and then, he, of course, he died suddenly. Well, here's Dan Osano running this academy under Bruce Lee's name. What, what do you do? And the, he, what he did was he closed it. And he was absolutely terrified that people were going to think that he would then capitalize or try to capitalize on Bruce Lee's name. And so he nearly, nearly took a vow of, I'm only going to train in private from now on. I, I can't open a commercial school. People will read it the wrong way. And he had to be badgered by a number of people um, before he would start to teach again in public. Um, one of the, like the actor, Steve McQueen, who was one of Bruce Lee's pallbearers, wrote him a really nice letter begging him to start teaching again. Um, a lot of the students said, you know, look, you're not betraying anyone's memory by starting to teach again. And he had, he had to be dragged kicking and screaming uh, and back into the world of teaching martial arts. And so he never told me this himself, but I think one of the best uses he made subtly of his connection with Bruce Lee was it enabled him to make connections with other people? They, of course, they were anxious to meet Dan and Osano. They were anxious to meet Bruce Lee's successor in a way. And so that just opened doors for him. And, I, and so he took something that first was a negative, which was you know the fear that people were going to think he was capitalizing. And instead of using it to make money, he used it to expand his martial arts knowledge, which was brilliant. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And it, that's kind of how I've always perceived him. I, I haven't been fortunate enough to meet him, but there's, there's always been that thread of humility, that thread of 
I guess, quiet confidence whenever I've heard stories from folks who have trained with him. And he's probably at the top of the list for me personally of people I haven't trained with that I want to. Well, you should come to my academy in April uh, 2019. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that off air. <laughs> now you have okay. my attention. And, and he's, I tell you what, he is just so fun to watch him teach. You know, he's, he's, I think he's 82 now. And, you know, you can tell he's an 82 year old man when you're ri- riding around in a car with him and talking to him, although he's a, quite a spry and energetic one. Um, and, you know, when you, when, when you take him into the academy and you get all his gear out of the way and, 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 uh, he always very humbly asked me, are, are, when would you like me to start? You know, <laughs> anytime you want to start. And, and so as the instant that the class bows in and everybody gets going, it's like 50 years fall off his shoulders. And I'm sure you've seen this phenomenon many times with other people. Mm. And it's just so neat to watch him just do his thing. Uh, in addition, I have to remember to pay attention because I just find myself grinning watching him, you know, do what he does so well. Training under Guru Dan has been compared to drinking from a fire hose because he'll, he'll show something like he'll show. I I have this mental picture of him, say, doing a a sequence with stick and dagger. And he'll say, well, one of my teachers did this sequence like this. And then he goes, now another one of my teachers did it this way with this little difference with your left hand. And another teacher did it this way. And his, his wife will, will have him videotape all his sessions and she'll watch and go, you're showing them too much. You're, con- you're, get- you're confusing him. And he's, he's constantly laughing and telling me all the critiques that his wife gives him based on, you know, she's a school teacher or was a school teacher. And she, she thinks he overdoes it and, and shows too much. But he, he's got this dilemma of there are people who come to the seminar. It's their very first exposure to anything that's not their, their, their uh, uh, start, the art they started in. Let's say some, some, some uh, young kid that's a a green belt in Taekwondo that wants to train with Dan Lozano and they show up. He knows that there are people like that there. And he knows there are people like me that have been with him for 30 some odd years that he would like to give at least one new thing to also. And he's, he's trying to, he's trying to, you know, have enough tea to pour into all those cups at the same time. And he does it so well. And it's just, it's a joy to watch. Yeah, certainly a, a dilemma. And I'm sure anybody out there who has instructed a mixed rank class, even, even in their own school, can relate to the, the, the dilemma there. If you can absolutely and it was, really want to share a great role model to learn how to do that too. Mm. How, how does, how does he, well, let, let's back that off a little bit. You, you, you are an instructor yourself, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So how has his influence, his ability to handle that situation, how has that impacted the way you teach personally? Well, first of all, I, I uh, constructed the uh, the schedule of classes and the uh, the curricula based on what I saw at his academy in Los Angeles. Um, I patterned it very, very consciously after the way he does things. Then bringing it down to a little more granular level, I I you know steal a lot of his his uh, ways of presenting things. Um, in one way, like sometimes I'll teach my regular classes, seminar style. And what I mean by that is today, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you, but it's not so that you'll retain the information, but so that you can see the connections between the different ways of doing this, achieving the same thing. Like if I'm teaching a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class, you know, normally I'll, I'll, I'll have a curriculum that I want the students to work on. I'll give each one a a task to do, um, walk around correcting the form. Then if I'm teaching seminar style, I, I start throwing out a technique, a techniques one at a time. I go, here, here's this one. Boom. I show it to them, make a few suggestions, turn them loose. I do not give them enough time to do reps on it uh, to the level that they may want to do reps. Then I come back and I go, now here's a related technique. Boom, boom, boom. Work on this and see the similarities, you know? And so sometimes uh, I teach to, to pass across a technique, but sometimes I'm teaching to pass across a concept. And that I definitely lifted directly from Guru and Osano. Um, I, you know, I'll say to them, I'm not concerned that you won't remember this sweep that we're working on right now, two weeks from today or two months from today. But if you can grasp the importance of what is in common between these five sweeps that we do, 
then everything I teach you in the future will make more sense and you'll learn it faster. And that's sort of a way that he teaches, a very conceptual-based method of teaching. I suspect that you, like myself, unfortunately, have been blessed with great instructors, but also some less than great instructors. And as you're Absolutely. talking about concepts, I think I'm, I'm realizing that the better instructors taught with concepts, whereas those that I would put in the not as good camp just taught the action. Right. I agree. I, and you see a lot of that. I mean, I, I, there's, a, there's a gentleman who I know who I, I love. He's a good guy. But he hasn't been, te- he's, he was a good competitor in the martial art that he did. He's a great competitor in the martial arts that he did. He terrorized the tournament circuit. Um, and one day I was, I tried to offer him a little advice about teaching, it, even though what he taught wasn't the art that I did, right? I was watching him teach and I, I tried gently to just offer a little bit. And he goes, Jeff, Jeff, he goes, how long have you been doing this martial art? I said, no, just, just under you for a little bit. And he says, okay, he says, I know what I'm doing. And I, I had to mentally disagree with him, but just not say it out loud because the way he was teaching was basically just, you know, here's a technique, do it. And he wasn't explaining why they were doing it or what the technique was for. Just like I had seen from so many bad instructors, just shut up and do it like I'm doing it. And eventually you'll figure it out. And that just doesn't make any sense to me as a teaching method. I mean, uh, intelligent students will learn despite having terrible instructors. I mean, that's just a human gift all through history. There are plenty of great martial artists put out that, that, that were, that came out of terrible programs. Um, and there are plenty of, uh, not maybe not plenty, there's a significant number of very good self-taught martial artists. I'm, I'm uh, writing a, 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 I think my next article for your uh, website is going to be on that, on the autodidact in the martial arts. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, to me, teaching is, is, the knowledge of how to teach is not derived from having taken lessons in the martial arts. The knowledge of how to teach is, separate. That's why you get a degree in education separate from whatever else you're going to teach. Um, Like one example would be, to me, one of the the most common sins you see is not striking the balance on what I call the the teaching spectrum. And what I mean by that is not over-teaching and not under-teaching. And we were just describing what I would consider to be under-teaching, where the guy just demonstrates it, says, do it like that, and just leaves you to yourself. But there's plenty of overteaching, and I was terrible about overteaching in my early days. Because I had so many under-teacher students, I decided, I vowed, I would explain very carefully, you know, the techniques to the students. And so a student would do a repetition, and then I would stand there and do 10 minutes on all the mistakes he just made. <laughs> mm. And, of course, that was ridiculously bad. I was, well, I was 19 when I started teaching. I thought that I was being a good teacher because I was doing the opposite of the bad teachers I had. And of course, Dan and Osano was a huge influence on me in not over teaching. You know, pass the concept across, explain it the best you can, uh, demonstrate it a few times, give them a chance to do it, watch them a little bit, but experience, you know, the, the, the dirty little secret that most martial arts instructors don't want to admit to themselves is that the universe is a far better teacher than they could ever hope to be. And so they want to, to sort of be control freaks sometime and just try to turn the student on their side and pour the information in their ear. And you just can't do that. You know, they've got to learn it. Now you can't teach it. You can throw it out there and hope that you present conditions for them to learn it. Um, so I, I, I really like, there were times where I would see a student come up to Guru and Asano and go, Guru, you didn't correct him. He did this and this and this. And he would just smile at them and go, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it just it just really struck me that it, his teaching method was, at first it, it baffled me, but then I came to realize that, uh, you know, he's a he's a firm believer in letting the student experience things in a safe environment, in an environment that's full of information. I'm just letting that sink in. Wow. Yeah. It's incredible. It, it is. It is. You know, inc- I, I often compare. I often compare being a martial arts teacher to being the curator of a children's museum. Um, 
And what I mean by that is, is that like, think about all the things you would have to do if you were building a good children's museum. You know, first and foremost, the kids can't get hurt there. You got to have foam padding on all the sharp corners. <laughs> and that's true of a good martial arts school too, right? You don't want sharp corners sticking out where people are sparring. You got to, you got to have a lot of stimulating, fascinating toys there for them to play with. Uh, you got to have playmates there, ideally, for them to play with, and and uh, and you got to have information there for them to, or, you know, lessons for to be learned from from the experience. Absolutely, it, it, that's a wonderful analogy, one that I certainly haven't considered, and one that I don't think I've heard before. So I'm totally giving you original credit on that one. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. I like it. Cool. If you could train with anyone that you haven't, anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would that be? Wow. Jagoro Kano is the first one that comes to mind. Yeah, you didn't have to think long on that one. I mean, a great, a great choice. Well, I, the reason I pick him is I, I think he stands, and then maybe I'm giving him too much credit because I don't, I don't know all of history, you know, and there are people who definitely could, uh, might, might say, well, he wasn't perfect about this or that. And I'm not trying to say he was perfect, but to me, he is the focal point of at, at the, at the turning point, the pivot point between the way martial arts used to be done and the modern way that it's done. Um, and he also, I don't know how much you know about, you know, about Japanese history and the Meiji restoration. Little bit. Um, but he, he would not have been allowed to do what he did with his life had he been born a generation earlier because Japan had a caste system and he would have been, he was the, he was the son of a merchant and that would have been what he did the rest of his life. And merchants were not very high in the caste system. They were necessary for the money, but they were not, not very high. They weren't as high as peasants in the caste system from the standpoint of, you know, how much honor they were given. But fortunately, he came along in time for the Emperor Meiji to seize power from the Shogun and, and to abolish the samurai class along with his oligarchs and to open up Japan. He was the Abraham Lincoln of Japan, the Emperor Meiji was. He, he, he liberated the entire population and said, okay, you don't have to grow rice just because your parents did. You actually can go to school. And I'm going to put together a, an education system and, and send you all to school. And Jigoro Kano was one of the first Japanese to get a degree in education. And, and he had both a Western education and an Eastern education. And part of his Eastern education was in jiu-jitsu. And he realized very early on that he needed to teach the martial arts both in a traditional way, but in a new way. He was one of the first people to popularize tapping to show submission which is a revolutionary thing. I mean, before that, you, you just fought. If you, if you and another, and another jiu-jitsu player wanted to see who was better, you went until somebody got hurt or somebody was unconscious. And tapping was silly. That was like, that was surrendering. And no man surrendered to another man. And of course, and I think tapping is a perfect illustration of going back to your question about can you train scientifically? Because the tap is a, is, is a way of saying, my technique didn't work here and yours did. Um, there's data right there to be gathered. Whereas, and of course, you know that in science, if you're trying to experiment, you want a large sample size. You want to do the experiment over and over and over again so that you, you get statistically significant data from it. Well, the tap allows you to do that over and over and over again and not get hurt, at least in theory. That was very scientific. You know, I'm not saying he came up with the tap, but it was my, from what I can find with my research, it wasn't done very much before that time. If it was done at all, it was not considered something that you did. I'm sure there were people who did, you know, folks that were a little smarter than other folks. But but insofar as systematizing it, I can't find it going back much further than Kano. And, you know, he. He was the direct uh, ancestor of judo sambo and brazilian jiu-jitsu i mean the, one of the two founders of sambo trained in, under him uh, in tokyo at the at the kodokan and um, of course uh, the guy who taught jiu-jitsu to the gracie brothers was a was a student under kano 
So think about that. You've got one man is directly responsible for three very, very famous martial arts. A pretty interesting guy. Um, I would have loved to have met him and, and you know, maybe he wouldn't have liked me. I don't know. You know? <laughs> I don't know what he thought of Guy Jean, you know, but uh, I would have loved to have trained with him and, and to have been a fly on the wall at that revolutionary moment in the history of the martial arts. So just as a journalist, as a martial arts journalist and historian, I would have loved to have gone back and looked at that. Yeah. yeah he's an absolutely amazing figure and one that I, I think we don't speak of enough. I mean, he's I agree 100 percent spoken about, oh, Kano, he founded judo. And that's usually where the description stops. Sometimes when people right. say, oh, he's the guy that popularized belts to signify rank over right. certificates. And I don't know that I ever heard anyone say anything more than that. So we actually we did a research driven episode on him. You know, we'll link that in the show notes. But I got the opportunity to learn a ton about him and was just blown away at some of his, I mean, really revolutionary concepts at the time. I mean, you just talked about some of them. But, it, you know, I, I think evolution, whether you're talking about it, you know, genetically or anything else, assuming that you believe in it, you know, there are these periods of time, these moments where things take a big leap forward. And martial arts, for the most part, has been pretty incremental. But I think we can look at Kano as one of those revolutionary steps forward. The quantum leap, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, he was, in a way, I think he was kind of, I like to talk about a concept from uh, science called emergent property. Um, it has to do with um, when the last piece of a complex system falls into place, the complex system whirs to life and appears to almost have uh, agency and have a, a personality of its own. Like if you have a, a, a component on your automobile, that is vital to the running of that automobile. If you take it out, well, your automobile doesn't act like an automobile anymore. It doesn't have that personality. So if you have figured out to how to invent the car with all the pieces except the last one, and you drop that last one in, boom, it starts up, headlights come on, you turn on the radio, and everything works. It has emergent properties. And a lot of times, have you ever noticed when you're teaching that you'll have a student who will make an amazing quantum leap all at once that just came, seemed to come out of nowhere. Where the heck did that come from? And I suspect that very often it's, his game was building, but he didn't have the vital piece yet to make it all work as a, as a cohesive whole, so you, you didn't see much growth, even though it was going on. And when that last technique or that last concept dropped into his brain and gelled, all of a sudden it seemed like he got a lot better. I think that Kano was kind of like that. I think there were forces at work, not just through him, but forces of modernity. And he was the guy, the right guy at the right place at the right time to throw the martial arts forward into the modern world. Because let's face it, I'm, it, it could have easily died because it was, it, it was really an anachronism during the Meiji Restoration. It was something that they were, martial arts was part of what they were trying to get past in a way, you know. And he saw an opportunity to turn it into physical education and, and use it in the public schools. And that was brilliant because I think he saved the, uh, the Japanese martial arts as a result to a large degree, at least saved it long enough for American GIs to then save it again and, and start to bring it to the United States. If folks want to get a hold of you, you know, where, where, where are they going to find you online? Uh, they can usually get a hold of me by the wrists and ankles. <laughs> um, so, Best answer um, to that question. <laughs> 300 and whatever episodes. That is by far the best way anybody's answered that. Oh, um, my email address is uh, the my 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 academy's name is the Rising Phoenix Martial Arts Academy, and if you take the initials of that R P M A A, then follow it with the numeral one. It's R P M A A one at gmail dot com, um, and uh, I'm I love to get contacted by listeners and by. Uh, other folks, uh, even if they got something a bone to pick with me, fantastic. I'm happy to do it. Uh, and I would love to get email from all kinds of folks. So send them in. And what parting words would you offer up to the folks listening today? I, um, I like to talk about critical thinking skills a lot on my podcast. Because let's face it. 
we live in a world that's far less violent than any world we've ever lived in. And if you don't believe that, buy a book by a guy named Steven Pinker called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And he has statistics to back it up for a lot of pages in the back of the book. You know, training in martial arts strictly for self-defense is becoming less and less and less important. But the real lessons that it has to offer us, you know, start to rise up to the surface more and more. Uh, so it's it's still incredibly valuable, but also what you're the way you're more likely to to be attacked in your lifetime is with um, to, to keep it in a PG rating uh, to be have baloney thrown at you uh, for people to try to con you, people to try to pull you into thinking what they want you to think or or buy what they want you to buy, and critical thinking skills are the self defense for the brain. And, um, and I think they go right along with the self-defense skills, you know, for your body. Um, and so that's something I talk, try to talk a lot about in my, in my podcast is just as important to learn to defend your body as to learn to defend your brain and your, your, uh, what you, what you grow to understand and to believe and to, ha- to understand that a skeptic is not a cynic, that a skeptic is this, the idea, the platonic ideal of a skeptic is someone who is exactly halfway between being open-minded to any new information and yet at the same time fully armed with the tools to test what it is that you're trying to get them to believe. So train hard and think critically. One of my favorite things about doing this show is that I get to meet people, to talk to folks who are like-minded. Because when I'm talking to someone who thinks in a similar way, it's easier for me to learn, to wrap my brain around what they're thinking, to adapt, to grow. And this is a perfect example of someone who just flat out had me thinking, not only during the recording, but long, long after. Thank you, Mr. Westfall, for coming on the show. Of course, you can find the show notes with links to Marshall Brain, social media, all kinds of other great stuff over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I hope you do. Please sign up for the newsletter. Maybe check out some of the stuff we've got going at whistlekick.com or on Amazon. And of course, if you want to get a hold of me the best way, email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love hearing from listeners. That's all I have for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.